these traders also were sure of the land's fertility. Didn't the fig trees bear, the olive groves increase, the grain fields flourish year after year? That man in the doorway, he was a farmer. He can tell us. He can tell us nothing. He's a ghost. And his land is in ruin. This was his olive grove. His trees marched up the sea. These were once flat fields of barley and millet. And as far as the eye could see, there were groves of cedars. Timbers for the ships of Roman Caesars, once upon a time. But nature gives no man a blank check on her resources unless he is willing to pay dearly. And so there's nothing left of the ancient farmer and his civilization but a doorway to nowhere. Things look better today to a farmer in the doorway of a barn in Pennsylvania. The harvest is coming in, a good harvest, because this man knows that each part of nature is inseparable from the others. That rainfall is useless to his land unless there are trees and grass to hold it. He knows that if he lets erosion take hold, his topsoil will go flying in the wind. And he can't grow corn in the sky. He knows he can't be forever taking from nature. And so, from his doorway, things look wonderful. When you come right down to it, can't you say that things look wonderful all over America if you look in the right places? Behold the fields of ripening wheat, enough altogether to feed half the world and then some if we want to raise it. Look at the fattening steers, the poultry ready for market. the immeasurable wealth of the sea. Ship at once, four carloads of lumber. Let's have an ocean of orange juice. And oh yes, keep the earth producing freight carloads of metals and minerals. Keep the oil flowing. But wait, can delivery be guaranteed forever? Is the world truly our oyster? Three-fourths of the Earth's surface is underwater, beyond the plow. That leaves one-fourth dry, but half of that is barren desert, beyond the plow. Or locked in ice and snow, beyond the plow. Or too mountainous to cultivate. Well, that's not too bad. That leaves one-eighth of the Earth's surface for producing food, timber, and fibers. Wrong. In many parts of the United States, floods wash away whole farms, while big chunks of the Southwest blow away in the bone-dry wind. Erosion steals land from the careless man. Thousands of square miles of U.S. pasture land is so thin that it takes 50 acres to raise one steer, 50 to one. Good land will do the job four to one. Every year, 10 million acres of trees and grass go up in flames. And insects destroy enough timber to build one million five-room houses. Oil wells do go dry. And even though we're lucky rich in coal, we're not adding, we're subtracting. Add one airport, subtract a potato farm and five orchards. Add suburban expansion, subtract thousands of acres of choice land. You can't grow beans in driveways, parking lots, and tennis courts. Add a thousand miles of superhighway, subtract millions of bushels of grains and vegetables. The machinery keeps clawing and biting away, subtracting. 
It takes nature from 400 to 1,000 years to make one inch of topsoil. We can lose it in the wink of an eye. I stand in this doorway because the ghost in the ancient doorway still haunts us. Now, speaking as a scientist, I know why that other fellow perished with his civilization. He didn't learn the laws of conservation. Didn't know how to use the raw materials right in his own front yard. He went bankrupt in a gold mine. Well, Americans, too, inherited a gold mine. And for 200 years, we acted as though it were inexhaustible. Well, that dream is finished. The cold fact is that we must have the best of science to save us from the fate of the ghost in the doorway. Most of us live in the present, unable to foresee disaster. And the same was true of people who were working and playing, dreaming and planning in 1904. Back then, a widely respected British scientist, Sir William Crookes, predicted a major disaster it is my opinion that the world is facing certain starvation unless we can find new and abundant sources of nitrogen for use in fertilizing the crop lands of the earth. But nobody seemed to be listening. In 1907, a steamship arrived in New York Harbor. By that time, serious thinkers in America agreed with the Englishman's prophecy of world starvation. There was the usual excitement at Dockside, but the reporters and cameramen were interested in the star attraction, a musical comedy dancer from Paris. On the edge of the crowd, scarcely noticed, was Frank Washburn, an American engineer returning from a one-man scientific mission to Europe. Nobody had any idea how successful he had been. But scientists were not outstanding heroes in 1907. And Mr. Washburn left the ship unnoticed, carrying in his suitcase one of the answers to Sir William Crook's frightening prediction of global starvation. This is what he carried, a sample of a black powder called cyanamide and a process to make it from air, coal, and limestone, three of nature's most plentiful materials. This black powder, a rich source of nitrogen when applied to the soil, was the first synthetic fertilizer ever produced in North America. Later on, scientists were to discover that it had an even greater value as a starting material for industrial products, with much more dramatic value in conservation. It was, and is, a versatile compound. It has a fertilizing action, releasing plant feeding nitrogen and also sweetening the soil. In the form of dust, cyanamide causes certain plants to shed their leaves, which drop off stem from stalk. Commercially, this defoliating process is a boon to cotton growers, who dust their fields a few days before picking time and set up the crop for an easy harvest. The process eliminates trash that used to come with the cotton. To the cotton grower, cyanamide means getting more and keeping more of what he raises. That is applied conservation. Unpretentious black powder, yes. But 50 plus years ago, it was a symbol of America's future in chemistry. The science nourished by Frank Washburn, by DuPont, Dow, Queenie, Hooker, Stauffer, Mallinckrodt, and many others. In the years since cyanamide came home with Washburn, chemistry has come into its golden age, and many hopeful answers are coming from chemistry. Chemistry for conservation, for better usages, increased yields, better salvage. Cyanamide itself played a key role in the replacement of the products of nature with the products of man's creative chemical ingenuity. Above all, chemistry is a servant of man, 
and the chemist by his very nature, a man of endless curiosity. In any chemical laboratory, the chemist is a man of many jobs. When he seeks to rid the farm of pests and raise its production of plants and animals, he's a farmer, a farmer in a lab coat. When he plans a battle against enemies of our timberlands, he is a forester. When he explores the realm of medicine, searching for chemicals that banish disease, soothe the troubled mind and prolong life, he is a good right arm to the physician and pharmacist. He is many men, too many men, the chemist. While I've been talking about the chemist, his problems have multiplied. 600,000 kinds of insects have been inflicting staggering damage to our economy. Creatures like this have been chewing, chewing away. Insects outnumber us several trillions to one. Their appetites are so enormous that the farmer works one day out of every 12 just to feed them. Their keep runs to adding machine figures. One and a half billion dollars worth of grain, cotton, vegetables, and fruits every year. Seven times more trees than are lost in forest fires. Sum it up. Insects cancel the work of one million farmers and foresters every year. It isn't a question of how much more the bugs would take if chemistry weren't backing the war against them. The question is, how can the chemists take back most of what the bugs are already stealing? This is an insecticide laboratory where the villains are raised on the very best diets and exposed to hundreds of likely chemical compounds. The research man paints bean leaves with what he hopes will be knockout drops then watches the worms at dinner. If they clean the plate, he knows he's on the wrong track, as he is nine times out of ten. But once in a blue moon, there's a discovery like malathion. One bite and the meal is over. That kind of compound is given the full lab test. Plants are sprayed under natural conditions to make certain the chemical won't harm the plant and won't harm the person who eats it. It's tried on houseflies, eternal challenge to insecticide chemists. Malathion bowls them over permanently. Then warm-blooded animals are exposed to the material. A chemical company may have a million dollars invested in a compound by the time research proves it to be effective in amounts harmless to man and animals. The big test for malathion came in Florida in 1956, where the Mediterranean fruit fly threatened to wipe out the entire citrus crop, as it did 30 years ago. This tiny killer lays eggs on the skin of the fruit and the larvae do the damage. At first, the fly was a local menace, but federal and state entomologists knew the invader could move quickly. And when they found him in traps many miles and several counties from his first point of attack, the order went out. Hit him from the air. The sky over Florida's citrus groves rained malathion for weeks. This time, no banks failed in Florida. This time, the tables were turned. This time, the medfly threat was checked. And the struggle against the bugs goes on. Above our insect-blighted woodlands, chemical mist is falling from planes, while spray crews on the ground complete the job. Chemical sprays make modern farming something better than a gamble against hopeless odds. In this age of insects, everybody would be losers.
without chemistry. Every single day, 7,200 new consumers are born in these United States. We'll have a lot better chance of feeding them if we can take back what we are now serving to the bugs, 9% of our national food and timber crop. At our present birth rate, we're going to have to feed 200 million mouths by 1975. Did you ever think that the family butcher might become obsolete? If the day comes when man has to compete with animals for grain and grass, animals won't be fed, and the butcher will vanish. That time has been postponed by ideas like this one. This is crude oreomycin, obtained in the early stages of the oreomycin refining process. We use it to bring home more bacon. How fast does a pig grow? For thousands of years, nature has answered that question, and man has accepted the answer. No more. Science knows how to accelerate the growth of animals with feed supplements. Here, the research man works with thimble proportions, but one half cupful of oreomycin is more than enough to enrich one ton of feed. Twelve bushels of this feed will enable the farmer to produce 200 pounds of pork in less than six months. But chemistry is doing more than helping man produce more meat. It is saving meat animals from natural enemies, disease, with preventive and curative chemicals, vaccines and antibiotics. A few drops of an antibacterial chemical in the drinking water of chickens means they drink to their own health every time they're thirsty. Chemistry goes another step. A minor amount of antibiotic in the ice water bath of a poultry processing plant makes chickens stay remarkably fresh for many additional days. This is conservation in its most literal sense. Beyond bread and meat, man needs many other resources to survive and prosper. And when nature can't meet the heavy demands for these materials, science is challenged to do it. Here again, chemistry serves to conserve. Look at these two samples of copper ore. This one contains 30% copper. The supply of this can't last forever. But there's plenty of this other one, 9 tenths of 1% copper. Years ago, this would have been called just plain dirt. Samples of ore come from all parts of the world to this mineral dressing laboratory. The owners of these ores want to know one thing. Are they worth mining? This research man is going to work with the copper ore containing nine-tenths of one percent copper. That equipment on the table is a flotation machine that duplicates on a small scale a process used in commercial copper mining. The low-grade ore is poured into a water-filled bowl. A small amount of a chemical called a promoter reagent is added. And then a frothing agent. The mixture is aerated. The promoter conditions the tiny copper particles so that they capture air bubbles. The frothing reagent floats these bubbles to the surface where they're skimmed off. No longer nine tenths of one percent, but 35 percent copper. Two pennies worth of promoter will treat one ton of ore, making it profitable to squeeze copper and gold from mountainous slag piles like these. Even more, it means longer life and better economic futures for mining communities. Fewer and fewer towns are becoming ghosts in the valleys. No matter how big a tree grows, only a small percentage of it can be used as boards and timbers. A chemistry takes what's left and converts it to practical use. Now this tough and durable wood is chipboard, made from wood chips and plastic. With veneer and plastic-treated paper, 
It can be made into handsome furniture wood that'll take more abuse than the real wood. Chemistry is isolating vanillin from what used to be wasted byproducts of wood. You may taste it in your next dish of vanilla ice cream. This is towel oil obtained from wood waste. From this oil comes rosin for sizing paper and other chemicals widely used in making drying oils for surface coatings. Another once wasted byproduct of wood is now used in the production of turpentine and camphor. This is sugar for animal feeds obtained from wood by chemical process. Adhesives of incredible strength, making possible an enormous national production of plywood. Well, these are all examples of what we mean when we say chemistry is at work in conservation. Chipboard, what is it? But ingenuity plus plastics. The very word plastics takes us right into the heart of conservation because plastics improve on the products of nature and thus take the pressure off our natural resources. Chemists pursued hundreds of lab experiments with cyanamide. Several years ago, they found that one of its derivatives, melamine, reacted with formaldehyde to produce a plastic. When this conquest of man over molecules had been demonstrated, a vast new industry was born. And plastics moved into every waking hour of man's life. had suggested in 1907 that the black powder would become one of the chemical clues to plastics and would also point the way to man-made rubber, which would prove to be better than natural rubber for many uses, the ideas would have been labeled preposterous. And if anyone had hinted that cyanamid would also be a chemical ladder to man-made fibers for beautiful clothes, this idea, too, would have been dismissed as preposterous. But chemistry is full of such preposterous ideas, most of which are working for man's benefit now, and more are on their way. For man is the most important resource of all. Chemistry's greatest role in conservation is the conservation of human resources. There's an old cemetery in a small town not far from here,
How many years of useful life are buried in that little country cemetery? Perhaps a thousand years lost to pneumonia, meningitis. If only they could have waited just a few more years, their stories might have had things. Because science found in the very soil to which every man ultimately returns some resounding replies to disease. Scientists had known for years that soil contains mold, but when it was discovered that a certain mold produces substances that prevent the growth of injurious bacteria, the great breakthrough to antibiotics was made. Chemists gathered soil samples from all parts of the world, and each soil developed its particular mold population. Occasional molds like this developed an obvious antibacterial zone. Thousands of these molds were deposited in a vault, a kind of bank of hope to be drawn against someday, perhaps to destroy the yet unconquered threats to all mankind. And after many, many blind alleys, a mold-produced chemical was found that held vast promise. Its chemical birth certificate called it chlortetracycline. Its working name is oreomycin, the parent of acromycin, a versatile and widely accepted antibiotic. If only they could have been spared for a few more years, they would have reaped these gains of science and walked the lengthened shore of life. Today's child has a brighter chance for a healthy life. The years of greatest responsibility have been rescued from many murderous diseases. A healthy, useful old age is no longer a daydream. Modern medicinal chemistry has given all ages a better claim to good health. We're working to save man from the ravages of heart disease and cancer, and we're gaining. In the last 56 years, man's stay on Earth has been extended by an average of 21 years. Forgive me if I don't talk about bright tomorrows and positive answers to every The chemical industry is substituting action for words.